Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of uh, What Makes You Click. Uh, it's my real pleasure today to have with me uh, a real god of the field, <laughs> Dennis Turner, who um, has, was a real pioneer. If you've listened to any of these podcasts, you'll have probably heard me say that, you know, when I started doing work in dogs in the 1990s, people were saying sort of dogs aren't real animals. Well, Dennis was working with cats <laughs> in the 70s. So um, and I discovered um, through a little bit of research that I did here, you actually started your career with bats and you went from bats yes. to cats. Yes. And Dennis is a pioneer, not only in uh, cat ethology, but also human animal interactions and uh, animal assisted therapies in particular, based in Zurich, although originally from the US. Um, yes. And uh he really needs no introduction uh if you don't know him you should um and i don't know where you've been hiding and i also learned just in the chat that we had before i'm really lucky to get there dennis because he nearly died twice in the last year yes uh, once with legionellas and once with covid but you're looking really well um Thanks. so <laughs> i'm so pleased that you are here the other thing i ought to say is uh you know people should know about the um domestic cat the biology of its behavior it's that turner in case you didn't know and it's probably the only book that i've bought every edition of that it's come out <laughs> thank you <laughs> um so um and you should see the first edition because it came out just as i was uh, uh, finishing off and really getting interested and it's scribbled all over everywhere but uh, i'm a terrible one for doing that but if they're my books, I like to. Um, and in, uh, the Domestic Cat, Cambridge University Press, absolutely seminal work in the field, up there with Leihausen's early work as well. Um, the, the book, Two Things Every Cat Person Should Have. So so welcome, Dennis. That's me yak yakking away, as I usually do. <laughs> Lovely to see you. As I said, you're looking Good well. Good to see you. Uh, and um, as I said, well, I, I don't know where to begin. Um, so... Well, we will start because one of the questions I have wanted to ask you for a long time and I've never got around to asking is, you've always been based in Zurich since as long as I've known you, but you're originally from the US. And as I said, you were working with cats. How on earth, A, did you end up in Zurich? And B, did you manage to make a living out of cats at that time? Okay, that's a good starter question. Uh, as you mentioned, I did my dissertation on vampire bats in Costa Rica. I was on a Swiss farm. Now, when we're talking about a farm, we're talking about 1,200 head of cattle, 80 horses, 10,000 laying hens, and so forth. So ample hosts, prey, if you will, but hosts for the vampire bats. And so I did my studies on this Swiss farm. And my wife, my future wife, is Swiss. And she grew up with the daughter of, uh, in the same village as the daughter of that farmer and her husband. And she, with two friends, came to uh, Costa Rica, where I was working on the farm. And 10 days later, we were engaged. Wow. <laughs> Very fast. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but she had to go back to Switzerland, and I had to finish my dissertation research. Before we actually got married, she came back for a month to make sure we weren't making a mistake. I thought I was had a tropical fever or something. I never believed in love at first sight, but it actually does work that way. And we're now married. She'll probably correct me if she sees this. I think 48 years now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we have stayed together a long time and enjoyed life together. But anyway, I came to Switzerland. I had to change my passport first, and she had to change hers to get her married name. She worked on the ground in the airport for Swiss Air at the time. And that was the only reason I couldn't afford anything. When we got married, I had three suitcases of books and three pairs of underwear, and that's it. So I had no money. She was sort of the blonde scholarship that, that uh, allowed me to finish my studies. And my uh, doctoral advisor, Ed Gould at Johns Hopkins, was so 
open, he said, well, if you can come over regularly to consult with me while you write your dissertation, I'll let you go to Switzerland and, and we'll have our meetings and so forth. Well, it turned out I could go over for very little money. I wasn't allowed to make any money flying around the world, but I could go fairly cheaply and um, did go over several times. And while I was writing up my dissertation, actually at the, in an office at the Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich, a friend of the farmer that I worked on his farm, uh, then um, I wrote the dissertation and started looking for a postdoc. And, and I wanted to work with three people in the world, only three people. Griff Ewer in Africa, unfortunately, she couldn't take on anyone because she was uh, deathly ill. Uh, with Hans Krupp in the UK, he couldn't take on any more students. And then some strange guy that I never actually had met, didn't know where he was, Hans Kummer, a primatologist working on Hamadryas baboons in Ethiopia. It turned out that his office was six kilometers away from where my wife and I were living during the first six <laughs> months. And it turned out he had a full-time assistance position opening up then. I gave an interview and a guest talk and I got that position. And a year later, uh, I was promoted to a tenured uh, lecturer uh, in the Zoology Institute of the University of Zurich. So I was very lucky that the position opened up right when I was ready to start looking. And I worked for a year on Hamadryas baboons in the laboratory, did go once to visit his doctoral students in Ethiopia, which was a fantastic experience. And uh, my, he told me that my chances of a professorship were best if I would um, go into wildlife research, which I did. I started a project uh, with a doctoral student on uh, roe deer uh, in the flatlands of eastern Switzerland. Uh, they were field deer, actually called. And uh, uh, about six months into planning that project, we did get the National Science Foundation grant to do it. I had an accident, uh, a simple accident at the university. I twisted my ankle and uh, I ended up having to go to the hospital and I stayed in the hospital for eight weeks, had eight full narcosa, nar uh, anesthesias, because they, uh, unfortunately it was the university hospital then called the Cantones Hospital uh, gave me a shot with something that I was screaming that I'm allergic to, and they didn't believe it. It's very, very rare. And they, for say eight weeks, they thought they were going to have to amputate my foot for a ripped tendon. <laughs> anyway, in the end, it worked out. I have a stiff foot from that, and I could start in wildlife biology after a reasonable amount of time uh, in therapy and so forth. Uh, the deer project was great. I enjoyed it. Uh, I had field deer to observe. We have them marked with collars and, um, and earmarks. And uh, also had, I took over a deer, roe deer enclosure, which is very rare. They're not easy to keep an enclosure. Uh, and for three years, I think further years, I ran that enclosure with my students and so forth. Did a lot of research, published a lot, but I found, ah, uh, you, you have to stop me if I'm talking too much. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> uh, I found, oh, a deer is, is uh, an, uh, eating plants. It's not so interesting as a predator or even a parasite in the case of a vampire, but vampire bat. But uh, I just started looking around and contacted the famous George Schaller, whom I had met earlier, and asked him if I could study panda bears with him in uh, Wuhan, Ch Oolong, China. He said yes, but he took me on, but the Chinese government would only allow my wife and I into the country without our children. 
And we were not going to go to China for nine months without our children. They were very young back then. And they said, well, we don't have any Western style hotels in Sichuan province there where we were to study. And I said, that's okay. We we're planning on living in a tent <laughs> in the forest. And, but they wouldn't, wouldn't agree. And so George offered to let me go to Serengeti to work on his lions. But you know, back then, money was getting very tight for these big field studies uh, like Jane Goodall. I know her very well and I see her occasionally, but those days are limited uh, for such huge field projects. And at that moment, when I uh, was thinking, what am I gonna do? Our cat came out from under our dining table and meowed. She wanted to be let outside. We were living out in the countryside and we didn't have a cat door. We just opened the door and let her out. Hmm. And I said, oh, you would be my lion. It'd be good. <laughs> and I sort of laughed and then decided, well, let's not get rid of that idea all of a sudden or too quickly. Uh, I was pretty sure that Paul Lehausen, uh, really the giant in cat research in Germany, that he probably had found out everything there is to find out about cats. But I spent a, a semester with all of my students doing literature research in all major languages, scientific languages. And we found out that we know very, very little about uh, social behavior of the domestic cat. And so I decided, okay, it's going to be the cat. I went to Cambridge on sabbatical to, to work with Pat Bateson, uh, who later passed, who unfortunately passed away yeah. a couple of years ago now, and spent some time there, met James Serpel and all the team there. I had to learn about cat behavior. I grew up with dogs and my it's amazing being one of the cat experts in the world today. My mother was afraid of cats and my father hated cats. They always did their business in his backyard. It's your rebellious uh, streak against your father. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And so um, after that stint at uh, Cambridge for three months, I think it was three or three and a half months, I came back to the new science campus of the University of Zurich and they had built me, among other people also, a huge indoor and outdoor enclosure, beautiful, with a pond in it and everything for cats. Well, uh, I, ha I have to relate this fact. <laughs> Within a week, my outdoor enclosure, I was at the end of a long enclosure. Marta Monzer is there now with her uh, Erdmenk and our Surikata. Uh, but anyway, at the beginning, I was at the end, right at the main door uh, to the enclosure. And the first weekend, my the gate to my cat enclosure was broken into, was, was rammed by a car. It was only open by about 30 centimeters. But all of my cats could actually, oh, the, the, the eight uh, mothers that we had could leave. Uh, that was enough for them to escape. Well, they were all there in the morning. And wow. at that point, I decided, oh, somebody wrote spray painted on the university. It's a new university wall, uh, dissect a teacher someday. Uh, they thought that my cats were part of uh, brain research and being mistreated, perhaps. That's probably the why. And at that point, I decided I'm going to go public. And I called a press conference and people came. And that was the start of a very long, very interesting, very profitable for cat owners, probably also profitable for me work together with the media, various media, television, radio, newspapers. I give an interview somewhere in the world once a month, yeah. <laughs> either by email or Zoom or whatever. And uh, it was at the beginning, it was very difficult because I was getting research money at the start 
I was partly from my National Science Foundation, but partly from the pet food industry. I won't say which one, but you know it in England very well. Yeah. And um, that was fine. But I was the first person at the University of Zurich to actually have research sponsored by the pr private industry. Oh, wow. Now, Nowadays, 90% of the projects are financed also by private industry, but everybody was afraid of strings being attached and control. I made it quite clear from the beginning, no strings attached and no control, you get acknowledged and that's it. And it's always worked out beautifully. Later on, I didn't have to, I get from foundations and all sorts of from government's support uh, for my research, but I was very grateful for that research at the beginning or that support at the beginning. So that's how it all started yeah. with cats, and it's been great. It's been I love cats. We've always had since my wife and I moved to the countryside back thirty. Ooh, when was that? In 1979, for 33 years, we lived out in the countryside and, uh, uh, and were able to always have two social cats that go out, could go outside. Now I'm 73 and uh, we, I have this stiff foot and she has some back problems, my wife. So we decided seven or eight years ago to move down onto the Lake of Zurich. I'm looking out onto the Lake of Zurich right here. Uh, and uh, we got an apartment um, uh, on the third floor, which is not ideal for cats because we're on the Seestrasse, which is a major thoroughfare. And I just, I'm not against keeping cats indoors, but if you do it right, but I just prefer having a cat that's allowed to go outside. So. I have to work with cats in institutions, which I do, in animal shelters, which I do, mm. uh, and with private cats in private households, yeah. which is where most of my research is take, has taken place. Wow. Well, uh, that's, so, I mean, it's interesting you say the, the thing about, um, well, Waltham. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. We're not BBC. I didn't it's say it. Name them, and they're around the corner from here. It is Waltham. But, and but it, it is, it is but that has always, I know, I know commercial research gets a bad name mm -hmm. and, but yeah, in my academic experience, the big companies have been exactly as you've described them. They want to know the truth. Yeah. That's and, exactly. you know, and, and they, the reason why they want to employ you is they want you to give them the bad news because they'd rather hear it from you than after a product is released exactly. or something, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, yeah, it's, uh, it, that, that's been my experience as well. And uh, that's small very good. Yeah, and I know a number of other people who've been supported by Waltham. Uh, I won't say their names. Uh, and it's always the same with them too. Waltham has always been interested mainly in creating harmonious human animal relationships. Of course, it's easy when you have the major portion of the world market for your products already, but still it's admirable. And I will, I don't have any support anymore from Waltham for years now, but I always, except on television or so, admit that I was very appreciative of the support that they gave me when it was needed. Yeah. And they do that now independently through the U.S. National Institutes of Health, which is great. They have this joint program, public-private yeah. sponsorship, and it's the NIH in the United States that does the rigorous peer control, peer review. Waltham just gives the money, sorry, yeah. I didn't say it, gives the money and they decide who yeah. deserves it. And that's a fantastic position, I have yeah. to say. No, I, I, very, I agree. I mean, I we, have, we, we have the big competitor of them here in yeah, Sydney. Yeah, you've got, yeah, you got Nestle there. And I, I mean, I've worked for I've, both of them. And again, the yeah. companies have never had any difficulty with me working no. with both of them. And, you know, what I do with There's one other is... Scientists. Um, <laughs> other scientists. Other scientists are worried about oh. it. <laughs> but yeah. uh, I think in the meantime, they all realize, I mean, Stanford, 
Stanford University in California, which I did not attend, is 90% of the research at Stanford is industry sponsored. And they wouldn't, couldn't exist without it. <laughs> I didn't so, realize that. No, I didn't realize uh, that. Totally. 90%. Yeah. Wow. I'm not saying they're all that way, but Stanford, which is one of the best US universities, is 90% uh, yeah. industry sponsored. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And as I said, it's well, as I said, our, our university has this sort of we what's what's called a civic university. So it's about being part of the community as well. And yeah, exactly. our front line for our research is research with real world impact or something like and, that. And I've always said um, my research is either supported and it has been supported by, by both the National Science Foundation or through the uh, pet food industry by people that are buying that pet food. And I think, and I, I have a topic with cats and human cat relationships, uh, and uh, my doctoral students have worked with dogs also, but I have a, a, a theme, a topic that is of interest to the public. So they deserve to hear what the results are and in a way that they can understand it. And we're very lucky, or I'm very lucky, in that my research is not that, uh, it's not about neurology or, mm. or nerve, uh, nerve, nerve uh, controls or things like that. Uh, so it's it's interesting to most lay people that are cat friendly. Mm. I'm I'm the last person in the world that says somebody has to have a dog or a cat. Mm. Uh, only if they can take proper care of it, and uh, uh, and that means that they have knowledge about its needs and and respect its needs in the way they care for and keep the animal. Uh, and if they don't want an animal, usually they're people that either have had bad experiences with an animal early on in childhood, or never had a true uh, relationship with an animal, say as a child. And that's a problem because they don't know what they're missing, but I can't accuse them of that. The only thing we can do is, for instance, with school children, introduce them in, uh, to safe pets and how to properly approach a pet or stroke an animal and not do it inappropriately. Otherwise, there are going to be problems. So yeah, I, I, that, I didn't, when I introduced you, I should have said that. You're also, yeah, perhaps a pioneer in that public engagement with science. And, and as you say that, yeah, making that public element, making science accessible. Um, yes. And, but so going back to the, the, the question though, um, because, okay, I mean, Wolfram decided to uh, invest in the cat work, but he, I mean, that must have been a pretty bold move by them as well to be interested in cats at that stage. You know, yes. surely dogs were the big market, you know? Uh, I mean, uh, yes, so, it was, and it is still. So was that your wonderful skills of persuasion, or was that? Uh, I, I really the right, I have to the right think part. about that. Um, I, I had already made a name for myself in the public in Switzerland. And I think it was with the help of the Swiss unit of Waltham, also FMs, that convinced, um, in the first place, I became very early on president of the Swiss national member of IAHIO, one of the founding members of IAHIO. Uh, and that helped along with convincing Waltham that, oh, this guy, even though Switzerland doesn't have much uh, uh, money from the standpoint of pet food, it's a small unit in Switzerland, we better get this guy on board. <laughs> that, uh, and I mean, I've been invited all over Europe to give talks, uh, mostly sponsored by that company uh, early on. Now, more recently, I'm sponsored by universities to give those talks, but, but I always, admit that it was the pet food company that started it all. And I, I, when I was president of IAHIO for 15 years, I think from 95 till 2010. Let, yeah. me, just, sorry, let me just jump in. People who don't know what IAHIO stands for, it's the International okay, Association yes. of Human Animal Most Interest. people today still don't know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The International Association of Human Animal Interaction Organization. <laughs> today, there are over 95 to 100 uh, member organizations 
and they represent some over 100,000 people wow. in ver various countries around the world in some way interested in or involved in the human animal relationship. Uh, it can be veterinarians. The American Veterinary Association is, is a member. Uh, and that's our biggest member, but there are many others and there are many small members in Eastern European countries and so forth, but that's okay. There's no, uh, there's no size limit or size, size expectation. And I have to say, uh, I just kept for those 15 years Ohio alive and was more or less a good administrator, I think. But my successor, Rebecca Johnson uh, from Missouri, she was the one who built Ohio into this huge organization. And her successor, uh, Marie Jose Anders Sledgers at the Open University in the Netherlands, uh, she has really developed it into a practice oriented, practical oriented society also with best practices and so forth. I'm very proud and very happy with the way IOHIO has developed. Now, uh, IOHIO is an organization, a, an umbrella organization of organizations, but together with James Serpel, Lynette Hart, John Bradshaw in your country, um, we, the three, James Serpel and I and Brad, uh, Brad and I wrote the original constitution uh, for ISAS, the International Society for Anthrozoology. Yeah. And other people, including Lynette and Ben Hart and Erica Friedman, were the co, the original founders of uh, ISAS. And that is an, the International Society for Anthrozoology, is a society of individual researchers and scholars. Yeah. So the two actually complement each other. The one is organizational, the other is individual. And at the beginning, I was very instrumental, I think I can say that, in keeping the two organizations at least back to back at, at their congresses, at their congresses. Nowadays, it's just too difficult to plan with COVID and so forth that we have the same, uh, same possibilities. But the two organizations exchange ex officio board members. There's a member of each organization in the other organization. So we keep informed about what's going on. And that's great. You know, when I said, I think in the preview before we started this, uh, I'm giving a talk at IOHIO, the, the opening plenary at IOHIO this year, which is online in end of September. And um, I'm talking about giants in the field. Uh, there'll be James Serple and Erica Friedman and all of these, there'll be many more. And I'm also mentioning some key younger researchers because as opposed to my predecessor, Paul Lehausen, I'm not territorial. <laughs> I'm very much hoping that young researchers uh, with interested in an academic career will start working more with cats and, and doing their dissertations and, and then starting research groups uh, around the world. Anyway, um, I'm, I'm talking about these giants in the field, but I honestly don't consider myself a giant in the field. I've done some good research, but I'm more an administrator and a diplomat. I've kept organizations talking to each other, of joining in and so forth. And I, that's my biggest accomplishment. I think, I think. you're both. <laughs> I think you're both. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you know, I, I, it's interesting. I don't, I did one, I don't of, these, I did one anyway. of these podcasts with Bonnie Beaver and she said, yeah, she was very much more that diplomat type role. And yeah. I, I, I just have no, no and I, know I don't I have, have those skills at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's interesting yeah. you mentioned because I, I mean I only know Paul Lehausen from his his work and whatever um, yeah. and I mean I don't want to stray off too much but you know, uh, when I was chatting to uh, Kathy Hout on one of these because mm -hmm. she spent time at Bar Harbor and she told me a little bit about Scott and Fuller so what was Paul Lehausen like as an individual and in his lab? Um, I'll tell you a little secret which I've never <laughs> mentioned in public before uh, it's okay, Paul Lehausen passed away about, I think, about 20 years ago. Yeah. Uh, 
uh, when I, I, in 1986, I had already started publishing some of my cat work. And in 1986, with the help of Waltham, also Mars Corporation, I was able to invite all of the active cat researchers from around the world to Zurich for a symposium. Which led in to? Yes, that one. <laughs> and in 1988, Pat Bateson and I uh, edited that volume as the first edition of The Domestic Cat. Now, uh, a number of people, including several very famous British uh, researchers, um, I don't mean to say the names, were not opposed or were not in favor of inviting Paul Lehouse as a speaker. And I said, you can't hold a symposium about cat behavior without inviting the grandfather of cat research, if only for the reason that for years, Paul Lehausen had received every single research grant on cat behavior from around the world. And Paul was very good, but he was also very territorial. You had to be absolutely top notch for him to approve <laughs> or recommend a research grant. And the example, and, and so we did end up, Paul is in the first edition of the book, and uh, we had to keep him, uh, we had to quiet him down during the symposium because he went 20 minutes over time and there were a lot of good researchers from around the world there. Uh, but anyway, and, and one of your colleagues in England was very good at telling him to shut up and sit down. <laughs> Again, I won't say who it was, <laughs> uh, yes. but, but we had him in there, and for that reason, he didn't get that book to review for Scientific American and so forth. Scientific American actually said that that edition was destined to become the Bible for cat researchers for the next 30 years. It's been longer because it's been revised and so forth. Anyway, um, Paul, Paul did come. I did meet him for the first time there. Uh, I, I enjoyed meeting him because I respected him very much, but fortunately, very shortly after his retirement, and this was before this R symposium, five research centers grew up overnight. Cambridge, Lund, Sweden, Philadelphia, uh, the University of Philadelphia with Eileen Karsh, uh, Ben uh, in California, UC California, and one other one in my memory at 73 is not so good. But within a year, five research centers on just on cat behavior. Right. And that shows who was controlling the scene beforehand. Mm -hmm. And we have profited not just from my and Zurich, that was the fourth, <laughs> fifth one. Uh, we, we've all published and learned so much more about different aspects of cat behavior, but it's still, I'm very happy that we had Paul in that first edition of the book. So we didn't invite him in the second edition, he was still alive, yes. but uh, we did our duty and uh, there were the book, the first edition was good enough, well enough accepted that we had no troubles uh, so, in the future. A few years ago, we did some work looking at the emotional state of cats uh, mm -hmm. using a, a, a facial action coding system. So, you know, you look at, um, yeah. And one of the things that struck me is obviously we went back to Paul Lehausen's original sort of diagrams. And I think they were constructed actually from videotapes. And one of the things we noticed was a slight lateralization in the move, in the position of the eyes at relatively low levels of arousal, but negative effect. Yes. And sure enough, if you look at his original pictures, it's there. It's <laughs> you know, there. And it's, it's just there. unbelievable. I mean, and I, I know I, your work and I know his original. Yeah, and, and it's just it it's phenomenal. There. But I, I mean, I, I don't honestly know who any of his students were. I mean, um, the know. only one that I'm aware of is Michaela Feiderer. And unfortunately, she worked with him also as an assistant in South Africa on the South Africa or on the African wildcat, uh, the possible progenitor of, of the domestic cat. And I have actually met her at a conference in, in Bregenz in Austria. And um, 
The problem with her, she hasn't published that much. She's good, but she hasn't published that much. And she's situated, or she was situated, I think she's retired now, at the Institute for Exobiology at the University of Innsbruck. Now, who's going to contact uh, E.T. <laughs> for cat references? Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a shame. Uh, but uh, he she was the... I think the only real assist, uh, assistant and student of Paul Lehaus, Rosemary Wolf, also was co-author of one of the books uh, with, with Paul Lehausen. Probably her, I've never met her and I've never read anything else from her. So it, Paul was very domineering and territorial. So I don't think he, and he was very difficult to be Quite honest, I've yeah. heard this from a number of people to work with. It was his opinion. He was good, but mm. it was his opinion, and that was it. That was it. Yeah. You know, I've had the, a, the luck of meeting a total, I think, of seven Nobel Prize laureates in my life, wow. personally. And and I've had I used to have lunch with one of them regularly here in in near in the Rotary Club that I'm in. Um, and the amazing Do thing name is, a name, please. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, well, there is Linus Pauling, um, okay. Ernst Gross um, at the ETH Zurich, uh, uh, Conrad who's the, Lorenz. Who's, who's the one you have lunch with? Sorry. <laughs> uh, um, Ernst, Ernst Gross. Okay. Uh, he worked at, he worked, he's now passed away, yeah. worked at uh, Rüschlikon at the IBM Research Center, which is two doors two villages down the road uh, from me. So, um, and it's, there are a couple of others. It, it's really not so important because what the point I want to make, I'm not name dropping, that's why I don't know the names anymore. But it, when you talk to those huge, important researchers, not one of them says, it's me. It was, they all say it was my team. And that's a difference. I mean, one of them, my very, very good, very famous institutes director at the University of Zurich, one of the world's ex, ex, uh, experts on ant navigation. Uh, he told me once, well, Herr Turner, you either have to get, an, an, it was this way, you either have to get and a uh, a call to become a professor at Harvard, or you won't be promoted here. I was never promoted at Zurich. I have a tenured position, but I, I'm a per, I was for 14 years, 14 and a half years, invited professor at a graduate school near Tokyo. Uh, and that's, that's the only place I use the professor title. I wow. never use it when I'm here. It's often, added by journalists, but not by me, because I don't want the people to be confused that I'm a professor in Zurich. I'm not a professor in Zurich. I was a professor at a very good <laughs> Japanese university. Uh, and I taught in English, of course, not in Japanese. But only, he always said, you have to, you have to go like this. Those, for those, hang on, because I've been explain. This yeah. podcast goes both in video but also audio. So going like this is not going to help. Oh, oh my! Oh, oh sorry. elbows. We're talking about. Oh yeah, the elbows pushing to the side. <laughs> you have to show your elbows to make it. Um, and I disagreed with him. Uh, I said every major, world famous person that I know has worked with their teams, and they acknowledge that their teams of research associates and even students have helped them um, make their discoveries. And I come back to one of my own cases because I always, it's so unfortunate. What, I, I'm sorry, I'm going off on the side, but it's one of the most stories. important discoveries uh, that was made. It was made by my then master student, Gerolf Rieger. Now he was an ethology student who was with a very famous ethologist in Vienna, but wanted to come to Zurich to study with me. 
uh, cat ethology. Uh, he was officially with the Department of Anthropology under Bob Martin, uh, the director of anthropology, but I was his uh, advisor, doctoral advisor. In any case, Gerolf and, um, and uh, discovered why cats and how cats can improve human moods, negative moods, uh, depressiveness, anxiety, and uh, introvertedness. Now, I have all, Gerald, Gerald was first author. It was always on my research project, but Gerald, Gerald was first author. He's at the University of Essex, by the way, now, as a reader, I believe. Um, he was first author, and I, as project leader, and I also advised him on this, was second author. The next study was still on my projects and we, it expanded with more data. And that was uh, Turner and Rieger, because it was mostly my ideas then, but he also worked on it. And the last project was Turner, Rieger and Gigox because Lawrence Gigox uh, with the Swiss Technical uh, University uh, helped us on the statistical analyses. Now, in every interview that I talk about these very interesting results about human moods and how they affect uh, cats and cats affect human moods, I always mention Gerolf's name. But the editors and the, yeah, the editors of newspapers and magazines, they only want to hear Dennis Turner. And in a way that's helped me become very famous, but it's not fair. And I've given up trying to uh, have the titles changed or, or the articles changed. I don't even look at things. You know, I get, I get an interview printed, a PDF from somewhere in the world every week with my name in it. And I, don't, I haven't even given interviews there. Yes. They copy things out of one and put it in another one and so forth, just so that they know they can put my name on it. And that's really unfortunate because some people say to me, well, why don't you require that they show, I don't have time to control in the first place. In the second place, they're often in foreign languages that I don't speak. It's nice <laughs> to hear you say that because uh, I mean, I just I'm said, sure it's but, happened to you. Well, I, yeah, and I've, and you know, I have been so lucky. And as, as I said to you before we started the recording, one of the reasons why I kicked off with these podcasts is because I have just been so lucky with the generous people that I have met. And yeah. there have been the odd one or two that have perhaps been a little bit more closed, but the vast, vast majority, um, you know, people have been so open and honest and welcoming. Um, and I, I remember uh, sort of, I, I won't go into great details, but it's... Um, Basically, I found out that because there can be a lot of politics in the field of companion animal behavior um, without <laughs> going into great detail, but you know, you know what I yeah, mean. Yeah, I know that. <laughs> um, and somebody said to me about, well, you're anti so-and-so. And I sort of, no. And they said, well, you're not a member of the organization. I thought, no, mm -hmm. because I don't feel any need. I'm in academia. I don't need to be part of that organization. Yes. And people thought, oh, well, you know, your lack of membership or whatever is an indication that you must be anti it and you, you've worked this through or whatever. I think, yeah. you honestly think I've got the time to actually think this exactly. stuff through. So I, I love I, the fact that people think that I actually think about things rather than just bumble yeah. into them. Yeah. But, uh, but it's just, I I'm sure. yeah. This has also happened to you, I'm sure. Um, especially young women, also students, when they're doing their mass uh, abitur or yeah. matura, yeah. their abschluss from high school or whatever yeah. it's called in, in the UK, uh, they're, they want to do that study or that uh, paper on cats or on dogs. And I'm now giving next Wednesday the fifth um, matura student, uh, the last interview I'm going to give this this time around because it takes time and I've given her she did, wasn't happy with 
that slot I gave her, which I can understand if they have other things going on. But then she said, well, is it going to, I said, you're the last one I'm going to agree to, and you've got 20 minutes. That's it. I just don't have more time. I'm still writing a lot of things, a lot of review papers and, and my PowerPoint for IIO in, in September. Um, I, and she said, well, uh, if we're having it in the morning, which I, she, no, she said, could we do it in the morning? In the afternoon, she had something else going on too. And I said, okay, in the morning, nine o'clock uh, on that day. Uh, and then she said, well, since it's in the morning, do you have more time? And I said, no. I wrote back, I said, I, I will give her half an hour. She won't hear this in advance, but I can't give her any more because I've already given hours to five, four others. And I'm happy to help students. And I'm sure you are too, but there's a limit to what I can do. I mean, wow. <laughs> it's, it's one of the things I think that students don't always uh, realize that actually, you know, and I, I'm I, like you, I've benefited enormously by having some brilliant graduate students, but it is still a very inefficient way of getting research done as opposed yeah. to having a research assistant. Yeah, you to, spend a lot of time. Do it. Uh, um, but I mean, it, it reminds me, and some people would have heard this story before, but I, um, you, you, what you just told me, one of the reasons why I ended up in behavior is because there was this guest talk in Bristol when I was a student and it was called The Interdependence of the Behavior Sciences. And I went to this evening lecture and thought, wow, this guy's good. And I literally nicked the poster off the wall and wrote to him and said, dear Dr. So-and-so, went to your lecture, it was brilliant. I'm a vet, I'm interested in behavior. What should I do with my life? And I got this beautiful handwritten four page letter back from who really? I discovered later on, Sir Robert Hind. Oh my. <laughs> you know, who, you know, I would have said yes. after, after Lorenz, he's probably the one who should have got a Nobel prize, you know? Yeah, exactly. And exactly. he, you know, 20 plus years later, I got my chair at Lincoln yeah. and I thought, well, I haven't, I haven't seen an obituary, so he must still be. And, and I never got round to actually thanking him. And I found out he was still around. So I wrote to him and said, look, you won't remember me, but 20 plus years ago, I wrote to you as a student and I'm now taking the first chair in clinical animal behavior in Europe. Yeah. And I can trace it back to that lecture. And I never got around to saying thank you. And I wanted to say, um, and again, he writes this beautiful uh, letter back and you know it's not just oh you know congratulations he's clearly spent time working out who the hell this guy is yeah, <laughs> contacts yeah. him every 20 years it's some really the hard thing yeah. and everybody that I've told this story to that knew Sir Robert said that was just what he was like you know yeah. he's just so generous to everybody yes uh, I, I when I was at Cambridge of course he had his office also in, yeah. in matting me for a part of the time and at the zoology department yeah. in downtown and I met him several times but I had more to do and he was that way yeah but I had more to do with his wife Joan Stevenson Hine yeah. and the beginnings of my ethological studies on cats actually his papers and her paper on describing relationships and so forth who were the basis of my original National Science Foundation grants. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah and I, I mean, I, I still go back to some of his early stuff and you just think, yeah, you know, he's really, it, it's, you, you know, yeah, the more I've gone into the field of human animal interactions and relationships, oh. the more you realize just how, what a clear thinker he was and light years ahead of his time in that yes. way as well. Yes. Um, Very and, much. I mean, and as you say, the other really generous person, Pat Bateson, yeah. who, you know, you could you could bump into him and say, oh, will you come up and give a talk? Yeah, I'd love to, you know? Yeah, I know. He came uh, with us to Japan once also in the course on, on the Congress in Japan. He was one of the plenary speakers. No, it was fantastic. Yeah, you know, there's only one person that I know and I can say it. He won't be turning over in his grave. But uh, my original departmental chair was Hans Kummer who was a very famous primatologist and a very an excellent thinker, but he published relatively little original research. He had excellent graduate students who did publish and so forth, but he was, as it turns out, and I, I really, I'm afraid I have to say this, 
Many people have thought that, and, and I finally am convinced that was part of our problem. He actually blocked my habilitation. The first to become private faculty member, also PD title, pri mm -hmm. privato ten. Uh, I, I had to do it twice. <laughs> the first time it went through fine. I had really very famous people writing the um, reviews of the habilitation, the second thesis more or less. And it went all the way to me giving a, um, how should I say, trial lecture yeah. in front of just faculty. And uh, they were ready to vote. And at that point, Hans, I mean, we met, he mellowed at the end and we were good friends at the end, but he raised his hand. Uh, I'm raising my hand here for your yeah. listeners <laughs> and said, my uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's not quite as simple as it looks. These are his good points, plus points, and these are his negative points. And th that had never happened, uh, that somebody got that far along to the voting stage after the trial lecture, that double, twice as many people voted yes for me as no, than no, but there were too many abstentions because they didn't know what he wanted. Did he want to have him or did he not want to let him through? The next day he said, oh, I'm really sorry that that happened that way, but you'll make it this, the next time. <laughs> but I didn't go a next time with him. I went to the vet faculty. Right. My uh, habilitation is actually at the veterinary faculty of yeah. the University of Zurich. Uh, teaching small animal behavior and behavioral problems. And for 10 years, I also led the behavioral clinic at the animal hospital of the university. Uh, I don't do that anymore because that's when I was getting at Christmas time about 100 telephone calls <laughs> or emails asking for help. And you know that situation as well. When you ask, well, how long has it been going on? Well, the last two years, I pay call on Christmas yeah. Eve. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I don't do advising anymore. Only a few, very few good friends, free of charge, because everybody, want, I, I was so well known in Switzerland as the uh, cat and dog flister, flisterer, whisperer, uh, that uh, they all only wanted to talk to me. And I have trained uh, in my private institute over 80 advisors mm -hmm. who have private practices in animal psychology, similar to your system in, in Great Britain. Uh, and since they were all wanting to come to me, I had to quit. I said, I don't advise anymore, put it on my website as well, uh, because only then did my former students have a chance of surviving. It's a difficult That's one. It is. is. Because as you say, you can cast a very long shadow. And it's, yes. it's, a, it's a shame because it's not yeah it's not what you want it but it, no. it happens and it can put people off uh, exactly. from from that close collaboration i just want to go back to um Gerolf riga's paper because oh. you mentioned it and it's one of the papers that um uh, just jumped out at me when I, I looked at your publication list and i just love the title um, and just because we were talking about it and, uh, spouses and cats and their effects on human mood i just what a brilliant title yes thought. It, it's um, a brilliant title and it actually revised the interpretation that both gerald gerald and i made in the two earlier papers because we had a closer look. Gerolf started out with his master thesis just looking at uh, women and their relationship with cats, uh, current cat owners and former cat owners, women, cat owning women. Uh, and the reason why he did that was <clears throat> uh, that if you found a difference in the effect of cats or women with interactions with the cats, People could say, well, that's because women with cats have uh, different personality traits than uh, average women or women without cats. So he looked at women, current cat owners, and women that in the last six months 
didn't have a cat. Something had happened and didn't have a cat anymore. That was the first comparison. He made some interesting discoveries and he actually made the major discovery there of um, what, what's going on. I'll come back to that. Yeah. In the later studies, including the one that you just mentioned with uh, Turner, Rieger and Gigox, we looked at singly living women women with a partner, also living with um, a partner, mothers, also with children at home, and at men. So we were able to compare all of these. And what we discovered still was that cats in their, uh, alone their presence, but of course, interactions with the person, they are able to reduce negative moods. Uh, like uh, fear, de de depression, introvertite, intro introversion. <laughs> yeah. But we could not prove that cats improve already good moods that mm -hmm. made them better. Yeah. Uh, and in the last study, the one you're mentioning, what we concluded that uh, a cat has the same positive, I'm, I'm translating from the German here, mm -hmm. Uh, has the same positive effect on women as a, as a man, but by men, a woman has a stronger positive effect than a cat has on <laughs> men. And there is one exception to this. When you compare uh, women who live alone and men who live alone, the effects of the cat are exactly the same on both types. Now, a lot of, I've given a lot of interviews to uh, women's magazines in various languages and so forth. Uh, some people tend to overstate this. It is a sort of a cute result, but uh, I wouldn't put too much emphasis on that. It's just a, a nice way of interpreting it. And it might be working that way. But it is, it's interesting that, you know, the, the stronger effect is this, buffering of negative mood rather than exactly. eventuation of positive mood and um, a few years ago I had a master's student and she got really interested in this whole area and um, as part of her master's she started to do a systematic review and yeah what um, from the human animal interactions point of view and yeah we could find reasonably consistent evidence for yeah buffering against negative mood but for normal people who well, well, and, sorry that sounds terrible but for people who didn't have mental health um, Problems, uh, issue, yeah. issues we couldn't see an elevation you know when you look at the literature there, there really isn't that much that says that yeah if you're a happy-go-lucky individual you, you're not extra happy because you've got a cat or a dog exactly. um, which I think is a really interesting um, exactly. finding and um I've got a it fits with what you found earlier. Yeah. And it's or your master's student found earlier. Yeah, no. So I mean, I've got a PhD student, and what we're doing now is we're we're looking at what it is that people do with their cat and dog and how that affects not just mood, but also their um perspective on life. Uh -huh. Um so you know, and I know that in some of your work you, you've you make that important distinction between state and trait emotions. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, and a lot of the stuff that has been on the human animal interaction actually is measured out those state or reactive states, which are relatively transient. And that's why we started to look at things like quality of life, uh, your meaning oh, in life, nice. you know, those yeah. sorts of scales, which seem to be much more stable. And we we're getting very consistent results across different groups. Um, there are obviously differences between the cats and dogs. Um <laughs> Yeah, because you don't walk your cat amongst other things but um i mean obviously one of the things that's one of the things that's really jumped out is yeah how much pleasure people get from taking pictures of their pets which is mm -hmm. you know well go back 20 years nobody had a smartphone but, <laughs> yeah exactly. you know, but it, it's become it is, yeah. yeah digital photography now everybody mm -hmm. you know they love taking pictures of their pets yeah. i think that's a fascinating area that we perhaps need to 
uh, or we could do so much more to look into. I'm looking forward to those results. Yeah. I'm not doing that type of research anymore now uh, because I don't have a cat colony. Mm -hmm. I, I do a company research project. I actually do have research projects, one in, it's not just my own, it's actually from a, an Italian professor at the university in Wuhan, China. Mm -hmm. Uh, that project is going on. It's being analyzed right now to see what the uh, influence or know what the effects of the lockdown, various degrees of lockdown on uh, the human pet relationship. And um, one, my uh, comparative um, studies of attitudes toward animals are, it's a, a standard questionnaire, which is been conducted in 14 different countries with five different world religions is now being applied in Nigeria, Africa, and in Iran uh, as well. Uh, so anybody can use my questionnaire as long as they don't change it. Sure. They can have it translated, yeah. but they cannot change it so that it still stays comparable. And uh, they have to acknowledge that it was originally from my group. Mm -hmm. But um, that's the only research I'm doing right now. I mean, it's, uh, you know, at 73, I'm, I'm a little older than you are. <laughs> <laughs> my wife would like me to retire finally i've got two more years of teaching animal assisted therapy in our course at the um, uh, university of health science in freiburg also switzerland uh, they took over our course in animal assisted interventions which we had given for 20 years uh, it was accredited and we were looking for a solution and the university of health sciences took it over we're still Myself and my two colleagues, um, Elizabeth Frick and, and Robert Tonner Frick, are a psychotherapy pair and a psychiatrist. Uh, we designed the course 20 years ago, and that has now been taken over and is now just starting the second cycle for two years in that. And the three of us are still main teachers, along with 17 other guest lecturers. And so, so that's nice. I, I'm sort of trying to wind down it's very you'll find also you do so much you'll find I think that, very well I, I think all i hear from people who've retired is that the only difference is you stop drawing a salary for all you do exactly <laughs> I think I, I the only recently difference. had contact with james serpel and he said what about retirement i i'm still at the university even though he had his retirement party and he's still conducting work and research yeah, still very very busy as well yeah. so Anyway, I, I printed out a few papers here because, uh, the, well, the one of the, um, yeah, one, oh, while I've got your ear, actually there's two things. One thing I thought about earlier, um, because obviously with you being fluent in German and English, I would say, you know, they're perhaps two of the dominant scientific languages. And there's lots of really good work that goes on in the German language that me as a typical Brit doesn't speak another <laughs> language um you know there might you must be aware of a wealth of stuff that is in the german language that's never really filtered through um, and i it's, it's with my students when they say this is the first and i said have you read every language before you can claim you're the first yeah. because yeah. they seem to assume if it's not in the english language it doesn't exist and i'm thinking yes. well you know obviously the people like uh doric Federson pedersen that she did some fantastic work uh, of course but I my, when I when I did dog behavior, I always was citing Dorrit oh. <laughs> in English and in German. <laughs> but are there any nuggets that you're aware of in the German that you think English speakers need to be aware of either this, uh, yes. or this work? I'd love to. Yes, some yeah. of the papers of Andrea Bates at the University of, uh, I think it's Erlangen or Rostock mm -hmm. on... Um, the psychological aspects of um, attachment to pets for juveniles and young people with different attachment degrees, different types of social attachment. Her work, some of it is in English. Yeah, I've, I've seen the book with her also. Yeah. I was one of five authors of a book uh, on that field that has come out in uh, German, English, 
I think Japanese and Chinese. <laughs> uh, and, but as far as, it's mostly her work that is very important. Uh, my protege, more or less, I was her mentor, uh, Karen Hediger, Karen Hediger, has just become professor uh, to replace um, Marie Jose Enders Sledgers at the Open University in Harlem, Harlem, uh, the Netherlands. Uh, she's just got the largest research grant ever given to a single person by the Swiss National Foundation, Science Foundation, which, by the way, uh, is. Uh, the, her path, she becomes in October already an assistant professor at the psychology department of the University of Basel. Uh, she's my successor as president of the Institute for Interdisciplinary Research of, of Human Animal Relations, uh, IEMT in Switzerland. Uh, she's also on the board of IAHIO. Uh, she's, she does too much for her own good, <laughs> but she is up and coming and she publishes some things in German as well, Karen Hediger. Uh, she's the head of research um, uh, in Rehab, Rehabilitation Basel, that's a private clinic. And she's really doing fantastic work on uh, the effect of animal assisted interventions for um, Oh, what's the, the English name uh, for um, ah, brain damaged? I'll just say brain damaged yeah. uh, patients who are non responsive and they're getting good results out of that, together with the head of uh, medicine at Rehab Basel. Um, and then uh, what's very important, and it's, it's a shame that the problem you mentioned that most, American, most Americans don't even know my research. Mm -hmm. I mean, I give a lots of tours, I guess lectures in Europe, but uh, ever since I was turned out to be against uh, declawing cats, uh, that's also against the American vet, I mean, <laughs> it's actually a position against the American Veterinary Association's position, it's okay to declaw cats, which I think in most European countries it's yeah. forbidden, yeah. it's cruel to the animals. And ever since I have said in several interviews in the United States, things like that, or overbreeding of certain dogs and cats, which is like the munchkin cat, which is mm. Dockelbeinig, but yeah. I was successful with an international cat judge to get that stopped in Europe for 10 years. And now it's been accepted in Europe. I, I can't fight forever. Mm. The main advantage of these cats is it shows they can't jump away, <laughs> they, nor can they jump up a tree or yeah. climb a tree and so forth. Uh, I've, I've, you know, I'm not that America friendly when it comes to animal protection. For 12 years, I was on a trustee of the World Society of the Protection for Animals. Right. And for eight of those years, I was the head of the scientific advisory panel uh, for the World Society for Protection of Animals. I'm not an extremist animal protectionist by any means. Mm -hmm. I'm actually favored a politics of small, but always improvements in animal behavior. Nothing, ex you know, um, massive like PETA does and breaking out and I'm not in favor of things like that. And I have made my opinions known in America, which is why I'm rare, only twice have been invited as a guest speaker and major symposia in the United States. Otherwise in practically every European country and Asian country, I've been invited yeah. as a main speaker. So I'm not very well respected in America and therefore, Many people don't cite my research in the United States. It's really a shame because I do publish in English as well as German. Yeah. And the most important document, there's only one journal, well, now there are two, but for the longest time, the journal Tiergestützte, Therapy, uh, Pedagogy, uh, also Animal, in, animal assisted uh, therapy 
uh, education and for, um, activities, mm -hmm. translated title, from Ingrid Stefan's Institute for Social Learning with Animals. She's the best in Europe. We're, we're the second best, but she's the best. Um, so many good articles are published in that in German language. That's a shame. I mean, they're, but they're all, most of them practice oriented, practically yeah. oriented articles. Also how to conduct tiered animal assisted interventions and so forth with various animal species. So that's a major, I gave a talk in Washington, now in Bethesda. I was invited as one of the speakers to the NIH, NIH, NIHCD, National Institutes of Health, Child Health and Human Development Symposium in 2008. And I spoke what I felt the truth was. I know the situation both in the States as a former American and as a European. And I made it quite clear that it's time that the Americans learned from the Europeans. They started everything as well as the Brits, also UK and the United States started this whole field. But in the meantime, the Europeans have by far taken over and advanced it far much further, sorry, bad language, but have taken it much further than the Americans. We have accredited two-year training programs, internationally accredited uh, certificates of advanced studies from universities, the University of Basel, uh, the Health University in Fribourg, and so forth. Uh, and in America, with exception, and I do admit this is an exception, of Phil Tedeschi at, the University, at Denver University, he has an excellent program, uh, which is a degree program for social workers with animal assisted work. Also, that's the exception. Otherwise, most of the coursework in the United States are just simple lectures for a semester or so. No real, how should I say, no real curriculum. program. Yeah, yeah, program. So, and I said this at the NICHD symposium and, and also proved it <laughs> with data. <laughs> And my paper was the only one that was not accepted in the books by Peggy McArdle, NICHD, and Sandra McEwen and, and company. Yeah, yeah. So it's okay. It's, it's, I'm, I'm just not that welcome in America. Uh, the rest of the world, yes, South America, I've given major talks at symposia and so forth. But the United States is a little bit off limits for me. And that's simply because I tell the truth. Wow. I, I have to admit that yeah, no, <laughs> as, a, uh, as an American or as a former American who loved his country, really. I mean, I love Switzerland and I feel more Swiss anyway than American, uh, but uh, it's very hard for me. I don't say that to any of my relatives. <laughs> of course, they would never, uh, couldn't accept that I know what I'm talking about. And maybe I don't know what I'm talking about, but I think I do. <laughs> Got a few years experience there. That, that's that's really sad, I think. Uh, as you yeah, said, it is. It's, it's um, it is. and you know, maybe somebody listening to this, you know, who understands a lot younger and got the yeah. German and the English can help to bridge that divide. The other person, you know, the other people are up in Sweden and now mm -hmm. Norway. Yes, yeah. quite a bit of good yeah. work going on. What? So uh, is doing is doing excellent new research on using the methods of phonetics to uh, investigate cat vocalizations, mm -hmm. and I'm really anxious to see what's going to come out of that yeah. because and whenever you apply new methods, Kurt Kottershall at uh, Conrad Lorenz Research yeah. Station at the University of Vienna also, Kurt and his team have used the theme video analysis program, the yeah. algorithm. And boy, they, they, fortunately, they've, uh, they've substantiated most of my findings 
with old fashioned ethological methods, but there's much more that can be done uh, actually, with uh, new methods. I actually examined uh, Vedel, the, his student who was using that theme. I, I examined her thesis. I remember it was yeah quite impressive. I tried to get oh, one yeah. Manuela, yes. 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 And it really, and it, it opens a door to totally new research. And this is why I, I'm really excited I, that part of my talk, well, I'm actually writing a paper right now for animals on open question, unanswered questions and hypotheses, including criticism of my own work, where we have not over necessarily over interpreted, but interpreted data that need to be experimentally yeah. examined. And I hope that that will come out in animals this oh, year. Look forward to it. Uh, that's the last major paper, along with the last major international talk that I'm giving. <laughs> for Talking of current papers, I thank you for sending me the English version of this French publication. Yes. <laughs> um, and if you got, if you, you're right for times. So I know you said you were. Uh, yeah, really, maybe another fifteen minutes. Okay, so uh, the the reference is. I try and do my French. Um, so just so that give it its proper reference, Le Chat de Compagnie, Ion Accès à l'Extérieur et la Faune Sauvage, Comment sur Estima et Mal Interpreter les Données de Terrain, which is in a new book, but basically Outdoor Domestic Cats and Wildlife, How to Overrate and Misinterpret Field Data. Yes. Um, and I, I, I mean, I, I, I read the uh, the, the paper and I again I hope people get a chance to read this in the English because I think it's a really neat uh, piece and I think it's a very balanced piece because there are those people who say you know yeah cats are destroying wildlife yes. um, biodiversity and, <laughs> and those people are saying well no cats cats are lovely and fluffy um, yeah. interestingly a few years ago and I, we never published it uh, we had a student and they started doing some work one of the things we found was that cat owners actually invested far more in feeding wildlife etc in their garden and invested in and had this more general interest um but the important and I, I think just to sort of praise this you as you say you you speak your mind you don't you're not there to appease the cat owners or the, or cat the haters, but you look critically at the sort of data and yes yeah. on the small islands cats can be absolutely devastating yes. so i love the bit that um it says where you, you you basically say giving the numbers of of animals that um are destroyed yeah. is fairly meaningless unless you know how many animals are dying each year anyway yeah. but also or produced each year or even produced each year yeah well this is the thing if you want a stable population you think about it you know um yeah. you know just something like free roaming dogs the vast majority are not going to make it to adulthood that's that's exactly. what happens you overproduce but also the alpha beta and gamma biodiversity and the fact that people have tended to focus on very local habitats when they've done exactly. what they see and what they see yeah yes and what gets in, brought home in their backyards <laughs> yeah it might be that they bring home yeah at one particular type um yeah. so I, I, I just wanted to sort of flag that is that going to appear in english anyway yes. no but i'm very happy you mentioned it and i'm very hope you will not have to cut this comment i have contractually permission from the publisher to send individuals that contact me the English original version of the article by email, it, they just have to agree to cite the article in French. And it's listed at the top, the official yeah. uh, French reference. But I can send the English article to anyone asking for it. So it is and, listed uh, legally. in the press. So has it come out yet or not? <laughs> Have I just no? Okay, no, it's come out this year definitely. It has come out. So okay, I've not done. No, no, it no. Much. It's come out this year. It has been accepted, and it has been translated into French, and it is currently being published and will come out this year. But I can send it already now as in press twenty twenty one. Brilliant. Okay, because I would certainly yeah you know and. 
The other thing is, and, and, and I think this is also a characteristic of your writing, you, you write at a level which, you know, you can write really good science that, you know, somebody who's just a cat owner can read this and understand this. And That's I know I've mentioned Alpha, Beta, and Gamma, <laughs> you, know, um, you know, from I've sort of talked about Alpha, Beta and Gamma di biodiversity, which people think, what the earth is he on about? But yeah. actually you explain it in, and then that's a real skill as well. And we go back to this issue that, yeah, you, you know, yeah, you're, you're the pioneer perhaps in some of the public communication of a lot of this science. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and that, you know, so anyone who is interested in cats, I would recommend that they read this uh, article and that they, or they're concerned about the wildlife because it doesn't, as I said, it Either doesn't way. say what the solution is, but it does say, you know, let's not jump to conclusions about it. And I think that's such an important thing of what science <laughs> is all about, is that science is about, it's not certain about anything. It's just trying to reduce some of the uncertainty. Exactly. And it would be important to, to mention that I will only, I can't afford to send it all over the world by snail mail i would have to be the request would have to come to me via email yeah. and all you have to do is google dennis c turner and you get my email address mm. on about yeah. 10 pages <laughs> yeah. yeah no it, it's it's really it's 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 a great little piece um so um, hey, thanks for the compliment no, yeah. not at all but it's been lovely to chat to you. And as I said, I know that you've got uh, other things pressing on you, but um, I, we may have to do a part two at some point, I think. Yeah, we did. As it's been fun talking with you. I hope I didn't bore anybody who's listening. I don't think I bored you. <laughs> no. Well, as I said, I, as far as I'm concerned, these podcasts are about me having a chat, a chance to catch up. Um, if other people are interested in it, great i'm not looking and if not you know, it's okay too. <laughs> i I, I, make them all, oops, I'm, I make them all freely available just and uh and i get some very nice comments actually and, and i as i said and i think it's important for people to see that um right. that the human side of of scientists and i'm well as i said i wish you well uh and you've had a scary <laughs> last year or so. years yes um and uh, I hope you stay in good health and that we can catch up before too long. I'm planning on it. <laughs> okay. okay. Thanks a lot. Take bye bye. Care. Take bye care now. too. Bye bye. After we recorded this podcast, Dennis contacted me because he realised that um, he got slightly confused when we were talking about the Nobel laureates that he knew. Um, he used to have uh, lunch at the Rotary Club with Ernst um, Gross. Uh, who was the cousin of the Nobel Laureate Richard Ernst, um, who he had met, uh, and the Laureate with whom um, he often had uh, lunch at the Rotary Club was actually Heine Rohrer, who was Nobel Laureate for Physics and worked at the IBM Research Lab in Bruchlikon uh, near Zurich. So just to get the record straight, um, he wanted me to add that. Uh, the other Nobel Laureates that he's known, Conrad Lorenz, Nico Tinbergen, uh, Werner Arber, and Jonas Salk in San Diego, who wasn't a Nobel uh, winner, but Presidential Medal of Honor for developing the polio vaccine. So just to keep the record straight, he wanted me to add this. <laughs>